Hello, I'm Dr. John Iskander. Welcome to CDC Beyond the Data. I'm here today with Dr. Karen DeSalvo, Acting Assistant Secretary for Health uh, and one of our most visionary contemporary public health leaders. Uh, welcome, Dr. DeSalvo. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. We heard during today's Grand Rounds about your experience as Health Commissioner of, of New Orleans, a, a city where we both did some of our training. What were the lessons there, particularly with regard to this idea of health in all policies? Well, initially, uh, was a, a very strong awakening that health, to get to health, would take more than health care. That just rebuilding our health care system after flooding was going to, uh, as, the as the data would say, make a difference in 10, maybe 20 percent of the health of an extremely unhealthy population. And really, our determinants of health were broader. They were about poverty and public safety and even transportation. And we learned, for example, that um, the bus routes in the city of New Orleans were essentially all designed to bring people to the emergency room or clinics at Charity Hospital and not really distributing that to an opportunity to go to the community health center. So there were a lot of ways that we had to re-engineer all of our systems, not just healthcare and public health, but all the other sectors so that we could begin to make advancements broadly in the health of our community. And, and I think uh, another insight there uh, was about public health being uh, I, I used to think you meant metaphorically at the table, but you really meant literally at the table. So, so what was that experience like as New Orleans' first ever health commissioner following Hurricane Katrina? There were a lot of tables that were sat to think about rebuilding our community, and uh, we were lucky in many ways there as the public health community because we were a part of a civic engagement rebirth, uh, and there was a, a great deal of thinking about what were the right voices and experiences and who, who should be there, and a lot of crosstalk and community conversation anyway. Uh, but public health, um, as, it, as it can be in many communities, was really weakened, not just by the storm, but by years of, of decreased funding, uh, some brought on, frankly, because we as a nation have forgotten how valuable public health is, uh, how it is a part of the infrastructure of our country, and have increasingly turned to the tools of medicine as a way to save lives great success in this country on using the tools of medicine, vaccinations, drugs, dialysis, surgeries um, to, to improve uh, life expectancy. But as some people may know, we've begun to plateau in life expectancy. And just as we took another look in New Orleans at what were the right players that needed to be involved, uh, the country's looking again and saying that there are broader issues at play and public health is a natural, um, uh, a natural leader in seeing that the conditions in which we live and learn and work and play are healthy so that that becomes the, the easy the easy choice, but uh, also just that the basic infrastructure is strong. It was, so I was in the midst of um, rebuilding and, and a part of our infrastructure in the community and and as I said got very lucky because we had strong leadership not only from our mayor but from other parts of civic society who recognized that to get to health we would need that part of our infrastructure to be strong or our health department in particular. Very interesting. So one way I think of your your work uh, at, at the federal level um, is as sort of an extension really of that concept of health and all policies. So for people who haven't heard what Public Health 3.0 is or who have heard it but really aren't sure what it means. Can you tell us where we stand and what that concept means? Public health is um, undergoing uh, an evolution. It's transforming. Uh, this began very organically, not only in communities like New Orleans, where we were rethinking how we were approaching health and with whom we were approaching it, uh, but I've learned that it's happening all across the country. It's the next generation of, of public health practice. The early days, uh, 1.0, were a time when the epidemiology told us that it was about communicable disease. That was the, the ways that we needed to support the public's health sanitation and vaccinations in that period as examples. But as the epidemiology changed, so did the work and focus of public health to chronic disease, non-communicable disease. 
uh, and and though that work isn't done, we've made a lot of progress um, in that in the space of non-communicable disease. Clearly, to really tackle more upstream the 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 causes of cardiovascular disease, the leading cause of death, uh, uh, even injury. If you if you as you move down the list, it really is going to take a broader approach, and that means um, taking a health and all policy policies approach. So working with transportation or um, housing, but also really being able to to lead the conversation and measure uh, uh, the success of addressing the social determinants. So these public health 3.0 communities are building on their 1.0 and 2.0 and really expanding their purview, thinking about how they work in a multi-sectoral fashion um, and are either at the table um, or leading at the table where, where appropriate. We're seeing also that they're considering themselves responsible and accountable to be a chief health strategist on the front lines. This is a, a term that um, uh, can apply really to, to many types of leaders on the front lines, but when the public health leaders begin to see themselves as being strategically responsible, not for executing on programs that are funding, but really leaning in and thinking ahead about the ways that they can broadly create a healthy environment, the conditions in which everyone can be healthy, uh, those are the communities where they're beginning to see a lot more success and are reversing the course. You know, there's um, um, some really nice work um, by uh, Raj Chetty that looks at um, uh, more than a billion data points of, com uh, of people across this country and looks at life expectancy and what are the underlying characteristics that, that predict which communities um, are, are healthier. And the public health is not called out in that work specifically. Um, there are a lot of recurrent themes in it essentially points to the entire community working together to address broad determinants like poverty and education and public infrastructure. And that, that theme is repeated in these sort of public health 3.0 communities and has given me, frankly, a lot of not just hope but excitement about public health being um, back, you know, sort of back as the convener of stature and, and being able to have, to have these really important conversations that I think are going to put the trajectory of life expectancy and well-being back on the right track. So one of CDC's always most important partners is uh, state and local health departments, mm -hmm. and uh, many of our Grand Rounds audience uh, work in those kind of settings. What does this idea of Public Health 3.0, what does or what could it mean for them in their day-to-day -day work and lives? Well, you know, in the, that we put out a report on Public Health 3.0 that's available at healthypeople.gov, healthypeople2020.gov. So if people want to get more into the weeds about it, we make five recommendations, essentially, about what success looks like. And then um, hanging off of those are another 46 recommendations. So there's 51 in all, but really five big ones about leadership and funding and data and accreditation and accountability and partnerships, and then ways that federal, state, and local government, but also the private sector can work together to create the kind of environment that allows them to be successful. What I heard in the listening tour we did about Public Health 3.0 and what we've, we, we have been uh, learning from other sources, uh, particularly people working on this on the front lines, is that this is the way they want to work. They want to be able to think broadly about systems and environmental and policy level change. They want to be able to convene and shape uh, health in all policies across government. Sometimes when they're doing that, it's short term or it's not sustainable because the funding they receive tends to be more categorical uh, because they may not have the data or the tools to look at the, the health of their community broadly. Maybe they don't have the right partners. So maybe business isn't uh, at the table with them uh, in as effective way as they, as they want. And, and maybe even as leaders in public health, and I, it doesn't have to be the health commissioner or state health officer or secretary. Everybody's a leader in public health. Our education and training experiences haven't always brought us the vocabulary that gives us that comfort that we can talk with the criminal justice system or transportation or the housing sector. So it's also incumbent upon those of us working in public health to be, to continuously learn and retrain to make certain that when we are having those conversations, we can understand the kinds of decisions that you know these other sectors are making and help them learn about the, the downstream consequences. So I do hope people will look at the report because we took the time also to think about what, what would be most impactful and would begin to bring this new world of public health 3.0 to more communities but help those that are engaged in it to be successful. Oh, and there's some case studies so people can learn about communities that are doing it and, and learn from them. So really a, a, a vision of a future in which public health has a, a leadership role um, not just in, in, in health but really in, 
improving society in general. And well-being. And, and, to, and to, to, to paraphrase something that we um, say sometimes in health information technology, the future is here, it's just not everywhere. And so I, we found that there are a lot of leading edge communities in Kansas and in Spokane, Washington, and, and, in, and in Tennessee, and in, and in the Northeast, Pennsylvania, there, and they just really need um, to be supported and to have kind of a framework and be connected to each other so they can keep learning and growing and advancing the movement. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. DeSalvo. Thank you, John. Please join us next month for Beyond the Data.